I'm Janet Kaufman. I am a professor of health policy at the Health Force Center and the Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies at the University of California, San Francisco. I've been engaged in research and policy analysis about the healthcare workforce in California for over 25 years. Uh, today, I'm gonna be presenting to you on California's physician workforce landscape and implications of that landscape for investment in physician workforce. Now, physicians are certainly not the only health profession uh, that plays important roles in delivering care in community health centers and other settings. Um, and, but for today, we are gonna hone in on and focus on physicians because I think there's um, so much important information uh, to convey that, that we need a whole session to do that justice. Our learning objectives for today are to describe the California physician workforce landscape, including both the pipeline of medical students and residents and the current workforce. Our second learning objective is to identify opportunities that align workforce program investments with physician workforce needs. Before going further, I'd like to show you uh, a diagram of the physician workforce pipeline. I think this is helpful uh, for understanding the various routes by which physicians enter our workforce in California. And, and so physicians all go to medical school initially, either an MD or a DO granting school, allopathic or osteopathic. They may go to medical school in California, in another state in the US, or to an international medical school. And from each of these three types of medical schools, they may um, train in a residency program in California, or they may train in a residency program in another state and find their way to California after residency. So just keep this in mind. We're really gonna focus uh, our talk about the pipeline on the California medical schools and California residency programs, but important to keep these other pathways in mind. And why is that? Well, if we look at data from the Medical Board of California uh, from 2020, we see that about 24% of our physicians come from California medical schools, meaning they graduated from a California school, could have been a University of California school, could be a private school. 48% uh, educated in other states. We have a long tradition in California of exporting Californians to medical schools in other states. And then 28% of our physicians are international uh, medical graduates from all over the world, um, although the majority come uh, from India, Pakistan, and China, and the Philippines. So now we'll look at medical school graduates, the medical school pipeline. This slide shows the trend in the number of graduates of California medical schools from 2003 to 2019. And we see that there's been growth over this period. We had about uh, 1,300 graduates in 2003, and we now have uh, about 1,600 graduates in 2019. So we've definitely seen some growth. There will be more growth as we have uh, several new medical schools that have not uh, graduated their um, first class yet. Those are all, by the way, private schools. These data capture UC Riverside, which is the newest University of California medical school. If we compare California to the nation, we see that nationally, um, there's been a more robust, larger uh, growth in the number of medical school graduates over this time um, period. And so we're, as compared to say in California, we've been a little slower than the rest of the country to increase uh, our medical school enrollment. Another important thing to consider about medical students is that most of them graduate uh, with debt. Um, this slide uh, presents data from the Association of American Medical Colleges from 2019. 
And in that year, 73% of medical school graduates had some educational debt, um, either from undergrad, medical school, or some combination thereof. Uh, and we can see that public medical school students were more likely to have debt, 74% versus 71, but clearly the majority from both. If we go to the next slide, we see that uh, the median level of education debt among all medical school graduates was 200,000, and that the private medical school graduates, while they are somewhat less likely to have debt, those that have debt have more debt, a median of 215,000 for private schools versus 200,000 for public schools. Uh, so this is why um, later on in the presentation, we're gonna talk a fair amount about loan repayment. Most medical students have pretty large loans to pay off. Let's now move on from medical school uh, to graduate medical education, to residency. And as we know, all physicians need to complete a residency to be eligible for licensure uh, and board certification. This slide plots data from the Accreditation Council on Graduate Medical Education uh, from 2011 to 2019. And uh, what these data show us are that over this time period, uh, the number of residents uh, increased um, from about 10,000 to about 13,000. So we've had a pretty robust growth in the number of residents and fellows. And I should say this is residents and fellows. So this is including people in those residency programs uh, that prepare them for initial board certification as well as subspecialty fellowship programs. So example there would be, you know, folks in cardiology complete a general internal medicine residency program and then go on uh, to complete a cardiology fellowship. In terms of graduates in 2019-2020, the latest year available, um, 2,802 um, folks graduated from California residency programs that prepared them for initial board eligibility and then 1,266 graduated from subspecialty programs. Uh, important to note here, in programs preparing people for initial board eligibility are typically longer than subspecialty fellowship programs. Initial programs you know, range anywhere from say three years for family medicine, general internal medicine, and general pediatrics to about six or seven years for something like uh, neurosurgery. And then subspecialty fellowships are usually one to three years. Um, if we look at where our residents are coming from, about 77% of them uh, graduated from a US school that uh, awarded an MD degree, 12% from a US school that awarded a DO osteopathic degree, and then 11% uh, are from international medical schools. Um, in terms of the number of entrants by specialty, these data are from the National Resident Matching Program, and they indicate the number of residents who matched into residency programs in March of 2021. Uh, there were a total of 3,419. Uh, the largest number uh, went into internal medicine programs, uh, followed by family medicine, pediatrics, emergency medicine. Now, of course, keep in mind with internal medicine, um, some of those physicians will go on to become general internists, but quite a few will go on to subspecialize cardiology, gastroenterology, rheumatology, or they may become hospitalists. And, and so while hospitalists are generalists, they're practicing in a hospital setting and not in an ambulatory care setting. Also note here that there are some residents placed outside of the match, but I think the match results are a good indication of the distribution across uh, residency programs in different specialties. A um, couple slides here on the geographic distribution of residency programs. And, and this really varies across specialty. 
Here, we're displaying the geographic distribution of family medicine residency program. So each blue dot on this map is a residency program in family medicine. And you can see there is a lot of clustering, particularly in Los Angeles County and the uh, San Bernardino Riverside Inland Empire areas, as well as some clustering around the Bay Area. Um, but you'll also notice that there are family medicine residency programs up in the North State, you know, one in uh, Eureka, Arcata, one in uh, Redding, one in Ukiah. And then there are a number of programs in the Central Valley. In contrast, let's look at pediatrics, um, another very important uh, primary care specialty. And here we see that there's really nothing north of Sacramento, um, not much in the Central Valley except for the Fresno area. They're just much more clustered. And, and one big reason for this um, is that pediatric residents need to do rotations in both general pediatrics and specialty pediatrics. And in California, most specialty pediatric care is given by children's hospitals. So the residency programs tend to cluster around children's hospitals. It makes a lot of sense for training, but I think can make it harder for uh, health centers and other employers who are not in close proximity to children's hospitals to recruit and retain pediatricians. Um, want to close the section on residency by noting uh, that California does an excellent job of retaining people who complete residency in the state. 71% of residents who train in California stay in California. That's the highest percentage in the country. As you can see here, it's much higher than Florida, New York, and Texas, the other three largest states in the country by population. You know, so this is one of uh, the reasons why investment in residency education is so important, is that in, simply put, if we can get people through to complete a residency in California, we've got a very, very good chance of keeping them in California to practice. Moving from training uh, to the current workforce, so that you have a sense of really what the marketplace, if you will, is like uh, at present in California. So as of January 2020, California had approximately 107,000 physicians practicing the state who had completed their residency and fellowship. So they finished their training uh, and they're here in the state. And of these 107,000, about 88,000 provided patient care one or more hours per week. Well, you might say, well, what is going on with those who um, are practicing but not providing patient care? Well, that's a good question. I mean, some of them are actively licensed, I should say, are actively licensed, but they may be retired doctors who are, you know, say volunteering, you know, maybe uh, occasionally. Um, others are physicians who are in research positions in biotech, uh, some are in educational administration, some are in administration in health plans and hospitals. Um, and, you know, those are important folks to keep in mind, but, but for our purposes, we really want to hone in on those physicians providing patient care. And, and actually, at our center, we tend to hone in on the physicians providing patient care at least 20 hours per week, because that's a signal of people who's really one of their primary professional activities is patient care. And so we've got about 75,000 of those physicians in California. And if we want to look at those physicians who we tend to call active patient care physicians by major specialty, and this is the 2020 data, uh, as the pie chart shows you here, about 31% of them are primary care physicians. And this is family physicians, general internists, general pediatricians, general practitioners. About 5% are in obstetrics, gynecology, 6% psychiatrists, um, and the rest in a wide range of, of specialties. This distribution by specialty in 2020 is pretty similar to what you would have seen in 2010, 2020, uh, and in 20th century. We just uh, historically have had about one third or so primary care 
um, two-thirds specialty for quite uh, some time, despite our expansion of primary care training. Um, when I then look uh, at geographic distribution, we're such a big state in California that, that statewide supply numbers um, are not that useful because the, uh, our supplies vary so much across the state. Um, and so when we um, compare supply across the state, we calculate ratios of physicians per 100,000 population. Well, why is that? Well, that's because we know California has a state ranges from places that are very rural, so rural the federal government calls them frontier, to, to places like Los Angeles uh, County, one of the most populous counties in the country. And so if we just look at numbers, well, LA will always have the most because well, LA has more of everything, whether it's freeways, McDonald's, Starbucks, doctors, always more. If you put things on a ratio per 100,000 population, if you put them on the same scale, then we can make more meaningful co um, comparisons across the state. And so what we see here with the primary care physicians in the dark blue and the specialists in, in the lighter blue is that our supply of primary care physicians for population ranges from a low of 41 in the Inland Empire to a high of 80 in the Greater Bay Area. So that's almost double in the Greater Bay Area than in the Inland Empire. Uh, other areas with very low supplies are the San Joaquin Valley and the Northern and Sierra counties. If we look at specialist supply, we see an even bigger disparity. Greater Bay Area, again, with the highest supply, lowest supplies in Inland Empire in San Joaquin Valley. Uh, so there are just many more specialists out there uh, to whom primary care physicians in the Bay Area can refer their patients than there are in the Inland Empire, San Joaquin Valley, or anywhere else in the state. Um, so this is a big you know, challenge. I think anybody uh, who's in a health center or other primary care practice in uh, certain parts of the state and has trouble uh, getting specialists uh, to care for your patients, in one of the reasons is there just isn't that, there aren't that many to go around in some parts of the state. Um, I want to also talk about the age distribution of active patient care physicians. Uh, in California, and I want to call your attention to the fact that 19% are age 65 or older. So 19% of the physicians who are providing patient care at least 20 hours per week are age 65 or older. They're already at what we would norm consider the retirement age for, for people in most occupations. And, and so, sure, some of them will, conti may, you know, will continue to work, but many of them within the coming decade are, are either going to slow down more or retire um, altogether. And then we look at the folks who are um, in the 55 to 64 year old age group, the group that will next reach retirement age, and that's 21% of physicians. Um, so clearly here in California, we really um, need to, to keep our eye on the ball as to how we're going to replace those doctors who are going to, if not retire, at least slow down uh, quite a bit. Um, I don't have a slide here, but I should say when you look at the northern and Sierra region of the state, this looks uh, even more dramatic. Uh, and when you look in family medicine as a specialty and psychiatry as a specialty, even more dramatic. So that those are two specialties in particular uh, and regions of the state where we really uh, need to be very mindful of how we're going to replace folks who retire. I want to also talk about race ethnicity. Um, we are, as you all know, one of the most racially ethnically diverse states in the country. Um, but certain racial ethnic groups really are profoundly underrepresented among physicians. Um, if we look at the lighter blue bar, uh, slice of the pie for blacks, 3% of our physicians in California are black versus 6% of our population. Uh, if we look at Latinx, 6%, only 6% of our physicians are Latinx, 
versus thir uh, 39% of our population. So we really have in both groups, but especially with Latinx, a lot of work to do to increase representation. Um, Asian Pacific Islanders as uh, an agglomeration of ethnic groups, pretty well represented among physicians at 32% higher than their proportion of the population. But what I think is extremely important to point out is that Asian Pacific Islanders represent people from a range of wide range of cultures and languages, and there's not a perfect uh, match between the Asian Pacific Islander ethnicities of physicians and and those of the population. Certain Asian Pacific Islander groups, uh, such as Pacific Islanders, Hmong. Uh, Laotian and Cambodian are not that well represented among physicians. So now that I've given you all of uh, this data about the pipeline and about the workforce, um, let's now turn to opportunities to align uh, physician workforce investments with needs. There's what can be done, what is being done to meet the California's need uh, for uh, more physicians to replace those who are retiring, to improve our geographic distribution, and to increase racial ethnic diversity. So I'm going to start out with a typology of strategies for addressing physician workforce needs. Uh, and this is something that our team at Health Force Center put together uh, several years ago for a project we did for Kaiser uh, Permanente and uh, the California Primary Care Association. Um, and I think it's useful to think about sort of four um, these strategies into four big buckets. One are strategies around increasing provider supply, the second, improving geographic distribution, the third, increasing racial, ethnic, and linguistic diversity, and, and the fourth, having to do uh, with data. So when we think of the physician case, for increasing provider supply, you know, probably the most obvious strategy is increasing the number of medical students and residents. Also important here is thinking about increasing the number of NPs and PAs because their scopes of practice overlap so much with physicians. Um, and indeed, in recent times, we've seen a lot more growth in numbers of NPs and PAs than we have in medical students here in California. Um, Improving geographic distribution. Well, three key things here are recruiting students from underserved areas. You know, recruiting students who have ties to underserved communities who want to go back there and serve. Also important to expand training in underserved areas, whether that's NPs, PAs, medical students, residents, so that during training people are exposed to what it's like to practice in underserved areas. Um, so that those who have a desire to serve in underserved areas get the preparation they need to be successful. And then finally, I suppose, expanding scholarship and loan repayment programs that provide financial incentives uh, for people to um, practice in underserved areas. With regard to racial, ethnic, and linguistic diversity, this has to be sort of a, lo a long-term uh, strategy and required long-term investments. It's important to increase K-12 students' exposure to medical careers. We have some wonderful programs that do that in California, like the Doctors Academy. Also very important to provide comprehensive support to underrepresented undergraduates and postbacs. We know that there are a number of underrepresented students who enter college aspiring to become physicians, but who get discouraged by their experience in basic science courses and need encouragement, need support and guidance to how to improve their performance in those classes. And comprehensive support programs help them to do that. They can also help them find inter internships and, and other positions that enhance their experience and their competitiveness, help them prepare for admissions tests. Also important for medical schools to adopt holistic admissions policies uh, that take into account a student's socioeconomic, demographic, cultural background, as well as their grades and test scores. And then finally, data. We just all need more and better data to help us make better decisions. 
hopefully this presentation has uh, illustrated to you just how useful data can be in workforce planning. I want to now turn to some recent investments uh, that are important. The American Rescue Plan, which was passed earlier this year, includes $800 million in additional funding for the National Health Service Corps. Um, many of you are probably already familiar with it. It funds uh, scholarships for um, primary care physicians, NPP, uh, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, uh, as well as mental health professionals. Also funds uh, loan repayment and two newer programs, rural community loan repayment and substance use disorder loan repayment, those last two really geared uh, at supporting individuals to provide care for substance use disorders in underserved communities. Uh, and that can include both behavioral health professionals and primary care professionals. We also have some uh, loan repayment programs in California, the state loan repayment program, which is really a shared program between the state and uh, the federal government. Uh, we have the Stephen Thompson loan, Physician Corp loan repayment, uh, the County Medical Services program, and most recently, Cal Health Cares. The first three on this list really focus on um, providing loan repayment to people practicing in underserved areas. Cal Healthcare takes a slightly different perspective and really focuses on service to um, people enrolled in the Medi-Cal program, regardless of where they might be living in the state. Uh, really almost hot off the press are some workforce investments in uh, the California budget and trailer bills uh, for this year. AB 133, which um, uh, recasts and expands the old Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development into the Department of Healthcare Access and Information, HCAI. Um, that includes 50 million augmentation for new primary care residency programs. Um, so this is on top of what's already available for residency programs with the Song Brown program and Cal Med Force. Um, Interestingly, if I can editorialize a little bit, doesn't provide much funding for psychiatry, and, and this is, I think, an important shortcoming because we have as much need uh, to replace our aging psychiatry workforce as we do in primary care. On a positive side, $10.5 million to launch a new California Medicine Scholars Program, and this is a comprehensive support program that seeks to work with young people who enroll first in community college, um, give them the support they need uh, to excel in basic sciences at the lower division level, transfer to upper division, could be at a Cal State, could be at UC or a private school, but to get that four-year degree and uh, be a competitive applicant for medical school. There's also $8 million for programs that support geriatricians or others providing care to older adults in underserved areas. So I want to close with what I see as some of the key strategies for uh, community health centers uh, for recruitment and retention. First, really important to nurture and advocate for community members who are interested in careers in medicine. So to the degree that you can partner with K-12 education in your community, um, college, colleges in, in your community, and really be a, a mentor to those prospective pre-meds, um, you can also you know, advocate for them in the admissions process. AT Still University has a hometown scholars program. UC Davis through Compadre is aiming to develop something similar. So to the degree that you can really be an advocate for those young people who are good prospects for returning to your community. Also tremendously important to participate in medical education. These could be clerkships for medical students, uh, residency programs or rotations. And again, we know a number of our uh, community health centers are now teaching health centers and operate residency programs However, that's not always realistic for every health center. So at the very least, participating in rotations with a local residency program. Really important to recruit for retention. And what do I mean by that? I mean really being mindful as your recruitment 
that you're targeting people who you're likely to retain, people who have ties to your community, people who really have a passion for working in a community health center. Uh, important to promote and participate in loan repayment programs, whether they be federal or state level. Um, also important to structure your compensation to provide retention bonuses. One of the things that we see with loan repayment programs is some people enter those really primarily with the goal of paying off their debt and they may not be as invested in staying in a community health center long term. And so I think to the degree that you can find people who want to stay but then structure compensation to provide a retention to sort of solidify that commitment. I think that's really important. And last, assigning your strategies for recruiting and retaining nurse practitioners and physicians and your physician recruitment strategies. Why do I say this? Well, there's such an overlap in scope of practice that I think it's really important for health center leadership to think through, well, what is the mix of physicians versus NPs and PAs in our health center? Also important to, to recruit with an eye to physicians who are going to embrace your health center culture. So if your health center really has a big emphasis on team-based practice, whether it's with NPs and PAs, medical assistants, health coaches, you know, really looking for candidates who are team-oriented and really impressing upon them the importance of teamwork uh, as the way you go about delivering care. So in closing, I want to acknowledge my collaborators and funders, and thank you so much for your time.